Hello, spooky friends. I am the Georgian Gothic, and welcome to my channel. My name is Ashley, and I focus on dark history and goth costumes, specifically in the Georgian era. As we all know, Halloween is coming up, and I have a very big project I'm making for the season. What that is, is yet to come, but I offer you this small tease. I'm going to be making a very particular reticule from the turn of the 18th to 19th centuries. Purses and tiny bags have been used for centuries to carry personal items, herbs, and money. They were carried by people of various genders at various points, varying in decoration from plain to extremely fancy. What we know as a reticule, though, came into fashion at the end of the 18th century. Dresses before this time accommodate pocket bags worn under the gown and access through slits in the petticoat, which I love. As, pocket, or as fashions changed, pockets were generally replaced with the trendier reticule. Some people think that they coincided and didn't overlap. I don't think pockets disappeared overnight though. This is because a lot of 1790s dresses still have a ton of skirt volume and aren't necessarily always made in diaphanous white muslin. Also, working class women who needed their hands free to do chores or labor probably couldn't dispense with large pockets so readily. There are also sources regarding pockets versus reticules in the 19th century. For example, Teresa Tidy's 1819 advice manual, 18 Maxims of Neatness and Order, advised, Never sally forth from your own room in the morning without that old-fashioned article of dress, a pocket. Discard forever that modern invention called a ridicule, properly reticule. But even if they didn't stop wearing pockets immediately, 1790s dress wearers, especially those wearing more fashionable silhouettes, wouldn't be able to wear ones that were very large or very full because this would ruin the narrow columnar silhouette that was coming into vogue. The turn of the 19th century has a lot of colorful accessories to liven up simple white or light colored gowns. A lot of these are very bold or creative. I've seen a lantern and a pineapple. This is probably why the reticule and later purse or clutch stayed so popular. You could get more variety and creativity out of these items and have the chance to show them off, despite pockets being more useful and able to hold more items. For this particular project, I'm going to be doing something a little unusual in shape, though. Spooky season, the best season, is coming up, and my upcoming ensemble is a bit on the gothic side, as you might guess, <laughs> since this is the Georgian Gothic. I certainly already supplement my 1790s ensemble with pocket bags worn underneath, which isn't quite as comfortable tying it around my waist where the short stays don't reach, but I also generally need to carry a lot when I go to events. And I probably could just get away with wearing only pocket bags, but I wanted to dress up the gown just a little bit and make it fit the horror theme better. Friends, I am going to be making a gothic human heart reticule. Hearts are not an easy shape to turn into a bag, surprisingly. On one hand, I was able to look at several strawberry-shaped bags for pretty good references, but on the other, all those valves and atria that turn a roughly triangular bag into a human heart in a historically plausible way are kind of tricky to figure out, at least for me. I decided to instead make a bag that's pretty flat in shape. While a rounder bag with more sides would hold more, it would mean I'd need to make the various anatomical add-ons three-dimensional as well. 
and my first experiment with that was way too heavy. The little bits didn't want to stand up right, and it just weighed everything down. It was not a good look. I made a paper pattern of my pieces in Illustrator based off a very simple drawing. The body is cut slightly larger than the linen buckram lining where the left atrium and right atrium are. This will make sense later. To get started, I basted the edges of each valve piece and sandwiched the linen between matching cotton pieces. I fudged what might have been actually accurate in construction by whip stitching these pieces together all around the edges, but it was way better than trying to turn the pieces inside out because of their weird shape and small size. And it's hard to say what 18th century folks would actually have done in trying to construct a bag shaped like a heart. To make the bag, I English stitched the body pieces together. I liked the idea of not having a seam inside my bag, and while I could have done a separate lining, I wanted to do this all in one seam. The other nice thing about the English stitch is that I can abut the pieces after they're sewn and they'll stand out from each other very slightly, which adds a little more dimension to the flat bag. The English stitch is a very handy way to attach lining to fashion fabric in a single motion. It's kinda tricky to show on black fabric, but it's this sort of fancy whip stitch that only goes through three of your four layers at a time. As mentioned earlier, the body fabric is much bigger on the exterior than the interior. These parts are sewn separately from each other with a fine back stitch and some more embroidery outlines. To get the details of the heart, I used bright silver thread to mark the shapes of the atria and the veins. I think it looks like lightning with this color combination on black, which is just so appropriate. Because mine is all black, I left it plain, but I've seen many embroidery hearts that did either a satin stitch or a long and short stitch over the atria, which if you're doing a realistically colored bag would look really neat. is so complicated, you might ask, why make an anatomical heart instead of a simpler embroidered reticule with the motifs just sewn on? 
though it didn't reflect in historically correct dress the way it does in mine, the growing study of surgery and anatomy was increasingly the subject of interest and debate in the Enlightenment period, as more and more surgeons began to study and more and more bodies were needed. Initially, the anatomy schools used the bodies of executed criminals as a sort of heaped-on punishment as part of the Murder Act passed in 1752. Many people in this era believed that what happened to the body after death would reflect on the resurrected body on the Christian Day of Judgment. In other words, if you dissected human remains, that person's body would look like it had on the medical table, or even just not exist because of the complete disarticulation of a cadaver during dissection. Executed criminals were the original subject matter because they quote-unquote deserved this extra body horror. As the study of anatomy increased, the supply of bodies became lower than the demand and a new trade was born in the form of resurrectionists. These people would dig up bodies and sell the remains to surgeons who needed to study anatomy. This was obviously frowned upon because people were terrified that they or their loved ones would end up dissected, but it wasn't entirely illegal because it was actually only against the law for a time to steal the grave clothes or items buried with the dead, not the body itself. The fear of resurrectionists, combined with the fear of murderers like the infamous Burke and Hare in Edinburgh, eventually led to the passing of the Anatomy Act in 1832, which among other things made it legal to use unclaimed bodies, such as those who died in prison or in workhouses. This started to beg the question if heaven was only meant for the wealthy dead who could afford a decent burial. Grave robbing and its ties to medicine has become a trope of popular culture, especially in stories of necromancy or mad science. It's this Georgian obsession with anatomy and the fear of what could happen to your body after death that inspired this heart-shaped reticule. After adding a drawstring, the bag is done. Or, should I say, it's alive.